Isaiah 53. Let's turn there. Listen, I'm going to be honest with you. I am not. I ain't got a long time. It's not even about wanting to do. I, I need 27 minutes. I can't do it. We got another service. We do. So if you don't get it all today, you will get. You can come over for the next one. Amen? Amen. Praise God. And uh, I, I might, I'm not going to... Um, Put him in the grave. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Come on, sir. We did a good job Friday. Yeah. Nothing else needs to be said. But since he out the grave, be careful. Be careful. this is what we're going to talk about today. Indulge me in Isaiah 53. Follow me there. Read the New American Standard. I'm not going to give you a bunch of Greek and Hebrew. I'm not. We don't have time. Maybe next service. <laughs> um, verse 4, please. Verse 4. Well, let's start with verse 1. Who has believed our message? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before him like a tender shoot and like a root out of parched ground. He has no stately form or majesty that we should look upon him. No appearance that we should be attracted to him. Meaning Jesus, you wouldn't have known he was who he was if you saw him. Verse 5, verse 4. Surely our griefs he himself bore. And our sorrows he carried. Yet we ourselves esteemed him stricken. Smitten of God and afflicted. But he was pierced through for our transgressions is the gospel. He was crushed for our iniquities. The chastening of our well-being fell upon him and by his scourging we are healed. Look at somebody on your left and right tell them I'm healed, I'm healed. From emotional wounds I'm healed. From sin I'm healed. Oh Lord. From sin I'm healed. From disease I'm healed. Yeah. Now I want to go to my text. It's Galatians 4, verse 1. I want to read Isaiah 53 for context. <sighs> but Isaiah, uh, Galatians 4 is my text. Now I say as long as the heir is a child, he does not differ at all from a slave, although he is the owner of everything. But he is under guardians and managers until the date set by the father. So also we, while we were children, were held in bondage under the elemental things of the world. But when the fullness of time came, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, under the law, that we might receive the adoptions, I'm sorry, born under the law, that he might redeem those who were under the law, that we might receive the adoption as sons. And because you are sons, God sent forth the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. Read this with me, verse 7. Let's read it again. Therefore, you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir through God. Father, thank you for this opportunity to preach and share this word. Lord, you know how I need you in my heart, my mind, that you will settle the peace of God, be my portion now. Deal with every alternative thought that's not focused on this text. Hey, hey, I give you praise for it now in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. On your way down, just, just gently tap somebody on the shoulder and tell them, pardon me. Pardon me. <laughs> At the end of the year, I'm giving out the Heckler of the Year Award <laughs> to none other than the Herald himself. Pastor Devon Anderson. <laughs> you got to take him with you everywhere you go. He's going to start traveling with me. He's like, don't nobody else say amen. We're going to have a good time together. <laughs> I'm serious. I got an engagement coming up. I'm out of town. So I'm going to put you on the, on the thing. All right. I'm serious. <laughs> Church of Galatia. 
Church of Galatia is Paul's church. It's a church that um, Paul started. It's born out of his spirit, born out of his responsibility. It was the product of his second missionary journey there. I believe on his first journey as he went, he saw and began to preach and began to observe the people and the challenges there off the Asian minor and said to himself, in this Greek Aramaic culture, it's important that I give them this gospel. It is made up predominantly of Gentiles. Gentile meaning they are not Jews by origin. They are not Hebrews by origin. Uh, and they don't have the DNA of that culture. Nor were they Judaizers or nor did they participate in Judaism. Much of them or many of them had a false religion, had a false understanding of who God is. And so Paul begins to preach and establish his church through his work. And he sees them as his sons and his daughters. He organizes this work. And, uh, and this work is very special to Paul. But as Paul is ministering and Paul is building up this church, he has to leave. And in his time away from them, there were those who were lying, said they were sent by James, uh, one of the apostles. They were sent by James and Peter with the understanding that they are to teach these new converts on how to be Christians. And their mindset was, if we're going to teach you to be a Christian, we have to follow what Paul did. Uh, but there's some changes to your understanding. The reason why is because though they were uh, called themselves believers, uh, they themselves still very much were akin to the Jewish law and still live by uh, ritualistic ideologies and concepts, ideas, and religious belief systems that the law provided them. There was a lot of mixture with their doctrine. They had mixed legalism with grace. They were mix mixing legalism with Judaism. And, uh, and it got really, really, really bad. And so in order for them to disrupt what Paul was building, they had to whisper the, discred dis 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 uh, the discredited posture about Paul's ministry. They began to share that Paul actually uh, was not who he said he was. That, that Paul was not really an apostle like the other 12. We've been sent from James and Peter, but Paul kind of made this stuff up on his own. It was his mindset that, uh, that Paul is not really qualified to teach you the way he's teaching you, but I know the truth. And the truth is, in order for you to receive this gospel, you must be cut. And it, it's, it's, they were adding the mixture of Judaism into the Christian experience. They were saying, you must be cut. Everybody said this, you must be cut. In other words, you must be circumcised if you're going to be a Christian. And Paul had taught them adamantly that it's not the works of men that makes you saved. For it is by grace that you are saved, not of your works, least any person could boast. And the cutting of the circumcision, should I just put it that way? And the circumcision was put in place to make men believe that because they did this, that they are saved. That something that was instituted by men would actually bring you closer to God. Let me park there for a moment for about 30 seconds. There was nothing you can do to bring you closer to God except but believe. And I know a lot of times in our religious dogma, we feel that if we pray 50, 11 hours, if we pray umpteen days, come here, Usher, if we pray for a very, very long time, or if we fast for 25 days straight, and all the, now I'm not saying you shouldn't do these things, but I'm saying we think that because we did these things, we have been made right with God. But let me tell you something, the only thing that makes us right with God is our faith in Jesus the Christ. Not our faith in anything else. Not our faith in how much we pray. Not our faith in prayer shawls. Not our faith in incense. Not our faith in church attendance. Not our faith in our anointings and our mantles and our callings and the oil that's on my life or the call. None of that makes you close to God. What brings us into proximity with God is the fear fact that we believe in Jesus the Christ. Somebody shout hallelujah. And so now they attack Paul's authentic call from God and they're trying to chip away at his mantle so that they can discredit his message. His message was grace through Jesus Christ. And they were angry with the fact that how dare you preach to them that they can have access to our God without the rules that we are obviously submitted to. It's the hate that comes along with false doctrine. Because it's the rules, the rules, because they couldn't understand how they can have relationship, get off me, how they can have relationship with God without the rules. We got 613 that we're trying to live up to. 
And all you got is love your neighbor as yourself. All you got is love God with all your heart, mind, and soul. That's tension right there for them. They said that Paul, they also said that Paul was a liar. Paul's telling y'all about this great, Paul actually preaching and living another reality. So Paul hears noise of it because Paul is frustrated with the reality that how did y'all get so dumb? I've been laboring and preaching. He says, you foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? Who tricked you into believing a different doctrine? You believe in a doctrine of death. Man, let me write you a letter and tell you about yourself. So Paul's intent is to write this church back into doctrinal sobriety. Mm -hmm. uh, because if the enemy wants to mess with Christianity, he comes after the doctrine. That's why there's been so much revisioning and deconstructing in y'all quiet. It's the scheme to cause us to be at odds with one another that we deconstruct what we say we believe. And some of us are even trying to deconstruct the virgin birth of Jesus the Christ, which is at the crux of what we say we believe. There is an assault in the kingdom of God, and that assault is after the doctrine of the Lord Jesus Christ. Because the enemy knows if he can get you intellectuals to discredit who God is, I can pull you into a whole nother belief system. And if I can pull you into that belief system, I can discredit salvation. We are in a doctrinal crisis. We are, in, we are in an apologetic crisis in our nation. And much of the warfare is not outside of us. It's within the context of the church. Many are even raising up to the point that we'll be bold enough to go. I'm going to say it. Gold enough to go into rooms that where our conversation about our culture is not qualified to be talked about and call our institutions whack. No, we are not whack. Y'all quiet. I said it. We are not whack. But it's the chipping away. Y'all see it? But even the elect of us, even those of us that know better, start buying into cultural Judaizers that come in and chip away at what we believe. Hoping that you and I will now see where well, I can kind of see where they're coming from. No, 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 no. You foolish Galatian. Who is bewitching you? got to be careful. Don't let Charlemagne the God and them get you messed up. These people put sage inside the room. That's not what we believe. Look at somebody and say, I'm not ashamed of this gospel. For it is the power of God through salvation. Come on. It is the power of God to the Jew first and also to us. I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. This is the gospel. So we are in an apologetic tundra. We are in a quadri of, of challenges. I don't care. A quality of challenges and difficulties and foolishness that are coming after us. Can't you see the writing on the wall? People are trying to discredit Jesus all day long. His name doesn't have a J in it. That's not his real name. His real name. Well, he, Adam was not really Adam. And Adam was really this. And, and there really wasn't an Eve. And in and, 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 and the Greek, it really means this. And, and you... you it's a bunch of young folk who, who, who just got to YouTube and begin to watch tomfoolery all day long and call themselves educated, knowing that the person whose books that they're reading is smoking crack for a living. It's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's an assault. It's an assault after our faith. And I'm waiting on the church to get bold enough to say, for God I live and for God I will die. I refuse to be embarrassed. I refuse to make myself look like I'm unqualified. I believe in Jesus, whether the whole world turns their back on him or not. As the old folks said it like this, because they had the Greek and the Hebrew, I know too much about him. They said, you can't make me doubt him. I know too much. I just know that I know that I know. I don't have Aramaic, Greek. I don't have Hebrew, but I know that I know. Look at somebody down your road. Tell them, I know that I know that I know. I don't know a lot about everything, but I know that I know that I know that one day he touched me and he changed me and he saved me and he redeemed me and he filled me and he's keeping me. This I know. This I know. I don't know transliteration, but I know I had an encounter with the Christ that changed. This I know. This I know. This I know. Tell somebody, tell them, this I know, this I know. Tell somebody, this I know, this I know. 
this I know that I should have been dead this I know I should have died this I know I should have lost my this I know this I know it's because of the Lord's mercies that I am not been consumed this I know all right let's get to this text so Paul gets upset when they he starts pinning this thing he says let me let me attack away first of all in chapter one let me help you understand something I'm going to walk up to chapter 4, but I got about four minutes to get there. In chapter 1, he says, let me tell you something. I am an apostle. Oh, and flesh and blood did not call me. What's on my life, man did not give to me. He uses the word agency, not from the agency of men. The systems of men did not call me. Let me qualify myself. They had to be called by other people, but God called me. If you don't like it or not, take it up with him. But God called me. Shout that way. God called me. Whether they voted you in or not, God called me. Whether you like my voice or not, God called me. Whether you come back next week or not, God called me. If everybody turns their back on you, God called me. With all my proclivities, with all my challenges and my hangups, God called me. And he considered everything about me before he called me. Oh, Lord. Paul, Paul had the audacity to tell them that I am called. I am called and I'm called to be an apostle from the agency of God. Man did not do this. Man did not elect me. God elected me. Look at how far somebody say, God did this. God did this. Tell them God did this. God, God did this. Paul, an apostle, sent not from the agency of man, but through Jesus Christ. Paul establishes his apostleship. He says, flesh and blood did not call me, but God made me. I wasn't selected by a board, but God made me. Then he begins to address the apologetic or the apostles' concern. He agrees that the Galatians have turned from the gospel of grace to the bondage of the law. And he pronounces severe judgment on those who perverted this great message. And then he runs over to chapter 2, as we saw in chapter 2, and Paul begins to tell them that... Um, that I did visit them, the ones you say, the ones they're telling you that did not elect me. I did visit them. In chapter 2, I spent some time with them. And when I got there, let me tell you, Peter was not preaching what you think he was preaching. And he was not living what you thought he was living. It wasn't sin, it was just hypocrisy. What he was doing is, he was, he was, he was with the Gentiles and he was eating the pig. But when he got around the Jews, he refused to touch it. And he said he was teaching both sides of his mouth. Paul says, I withstood him to his face. Uh, this is y'all's problem. Y'all like to have confrontation. Paul says, since you want to discredit me, let me tell you, I checked Peter to his face. And I told Peter, Peter, you being the bigger hypocrite right now. Since y'all want to say I'm false, Peter, you're being the hypocrite. And when Paul preached that gospel, he got that understanding. And they, I believe, they began to read this letter. And they saw, well, my God, Paul went to him and, uh, and, 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 and approached him and checked him. They're like, oh, my God, Paul is a wild boy. And Paul starts telling them in, in chapter 2 that you don't have to be circumcised. It's true that, that, that I and Titus, we, we were circumcised. But you don't have to be circumcised. That, that what was good for the Jews in Judaism is not, does not work necessarily over here. You can keep that religion in that expression keep your your rules in that expression but over here in this expression that don't work over here shout that don't work over here Paul deals with them again in chapter 3 and he says that you have become I need you to turn back to the gospel and then he tells them that how Abraham was saved that he was justified by faith he tells them let me deal with your father do you know that Abraham was not saved because of what he did he was saved because he believed and it was by faith come on here that, that, that he obtained a good report it was, it was the ideology that his belief in God is the reason why Abraham was saved and he's arguing that what makes you saved is not what you do but even if your father had to believe to be saved then even you need to believe to be saved are y'all here I got about 12 minutes. Are y'all ready? And then he does something very interesting. He begins to argue about the work of the Spirit. What he does in chapter 3, verse 26 and 27, he tells them he's, be, he's baptized his repenting Jews into the body of Christ. And why does he do it? He, he assures that all may share in the promise once given to Abraham. And then we rush on to chapter 4. In chapter 4, he argues the ideology of a legal illustration. That a Roman father and his son, the frustration until... 
the child being young until he comes of age, the son can enjoy very little of his father's estate. But then in verse 2, he says, but upon coming of age, the son can enjoy all of his father's estate. And uh, in verse 3, he shows us that while under the law, that they enjoyed very little of the father's estate. Which means as long as these people were living underneath the law, they had very little access to the freedom and the reality of all the liberties that the father has because they were living under the law. Do you see the picture? That as long as you're living under the rules of the law, that you are limited in your access to the father. Do you see the picture? That as long as you're living under the rules of the law, you have very little access to the fullness of the kingdom. But he says, but now that you have come of age, now that you're at the place of revelation and understanding, now that you have been matured just a little bit, upon coming into that agency, that now after Christ's death, you can enjoy all of the father's estate. But that ain't the argument. The argument is verse 4. I said all that to get to verse 4. And I hope y'all caught it because I ain't got time. But it says, when the fullness of time had come. Now, I ain't going to go to the grave. But the fullness of time bothered me. And it's been bothering me for years. Because I'm, I'm trying to figure out. What do you mean by fullness of time? If Paul says the fullness of time had come, we can say set time. We can say appointed time. We can say anointed time. But fullness of time. So what is in the fullness? What, what's in the fullness? And theologians are arguing, and, and, and it's a good argument, and many agree, that at this particular time, what made this so significant is that this time period is a time where men begin to, if I can work it like this, they suggest that the world conditions were ripe for the spread of the gospel. Yeah, they suggest that the Romans had ushered in an era of relative peace through law and order. That their network of roads made travel more convenient, you see. That there was widespread usage of the Greek language simplified communication. It, it was a time where the technology of that day was at its finest. Oh, yeah. That's the finest. It was at a time where everything was up to date and modern. It was the fullness of time. It was when there was no excuses not to be able to share or communicate this word. Uh, I, I want to argue for a moment that I think we are living in the fullness of time. That, 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 that we have podcasts and, yeah. and cell phones yeah. and, and, and we, have, we, have, we have books and we have streams and we have all these different ways to communicate this gospel. And God was looking for a time where technology caught up with the, with the ability to carry this word to the nations. Men begin to write, men begin to scribe out. The, the brilliance and the articulation of it, it was at the highest form. But not only that, the fullness of time was this, Gigi. It says at the same time, it was also the proliferation of empty religions among people. Many created spiritual hunger. It was a time where technology was at its best, but the people were hungry. Mm. Because there were so many false religions popping up. Let me walk there. <laughs> There were so many different spiritualisms that were popping up. I'm not churchy, I'm spiritual. It was just, it was, it was, it was those who didn't believe in the four walls of the, of the context and didn't believe in traditional. I don't believe in traditional church. It's relationship over religion. Fool, it's relationship informs religion, dummy. That's what it does. It, sorry, y'all. It brings you, I, I'm not talking to y'all, I'm talking to the culture. It brings, I'm not talking to y'all, don't be afraid, I'm talking to the culture. It's stupid. It, if, if I have relationship with you, it informs my religion. Do you love your spouse? If you do, you religiously share that. Your relationship is informing what you religiously do. Do you pay your bills? It's because you have a relationship with things being on. Come on, talk to somebody next to you and say, I'm religious as well. I'm not just, my relationship informs my religiosity. Do you brush your teeth in the morning? You do that as a religion every single day. It's a set of belief and practices because you have a relationship with smelling good. 
at the fullness of time. Six minutes. At the fullness of time. Help me, Holy Ghost. At the fullness of time. When the time had fully come. Technology is at its highest. Infrastructure is at its best. Language is as clean as it has ever been. Yet and still there was a hunger. Let me find America. With all of the stuff that we have gained. Yet and still we are hungry. Oh, yeah. We're looking at a nation now that has birthed and developed a hunger. Don't hate on everybody. Some people are searching. Some people are looking because we are hungry. At the fullness of time, God sent his son, born of a woman, which means he now has to experience all that we would experience. He has to be tempted by everything you and I have been tempted with. Oh, your Jesus. I want you to think about your wild, no, no. Think about your temptations. Consider that Christ was tempted too. You thought you were the only one that had to refrain from touching something? You ain't special. You're the only one that had to refrain from drinking something? You ain't special. You're the only one that wasn't invited to come over after hours? Oh, uh, I believe that Jesus knows. Hey, hey, hey. I believe he knew, especially after the anointing came upon him. And people began to discover who he was. Don't you think that everybody in the multitude was there with the right intentions? Someone wanted him to touch them, but they had a whole different understanding. But he was tempted like we are, yet without sin, he did not fall for it. Look at somebody tell him, don't fall for it, don't fall for it. He was tempted so that he can have, he can have understanding and relationship, uh, even with our own hangups and our own situations. Uh, don't think that your situation is so nasty that Jesus couldn't understand it. No, he was tempted in the same way you were tempted. There were men after him and women after him. Y'all quiet. Y'all quiet. Y'all quiet. Well, it's not written in the Bible. But the scripture says that he was tempted in all points. That everything that you and I were tempted with, he has been tempted with himself. And it had to happen. It had to happen. Because if it didn't happen, woo, he couldn't die for my own temptations. Oh, Lord Jesus. I ain't got time to finish. I might as well close right here. If it did not happen the way it was supposed to happen, then he wouldn't be able, I wouldn't be able to know that he died for the secrets that nobody knows about me. Uh, if it didn't happen the way it was supposed to happen, then no one would know that he would have died for the mistakes that nobody knows I made, for the choices and the decisions that I constantly make. He died for those decisions, and he was hanged there, and at the appointed time, the fullness of time, God sent his son, born of the woman, to redeem. Now, here's the argument, D. You clean it away. Here's the argument. To redeem, I'm sorry. To redeem. Everybody shout redeem. redeem. That word redeem. Oh, Lord. Thank you, Michael. <laughs> it is also a transactional word. Yes. Yes. <laughs> I was like, get out of there. <laughs> it's a transactional word. But it's actually a poor word. Greek theologians, many Greek, they, they're like, I wish the King James never used that word because we built whole doctrines around redemption. And it is a word, but in the way that we use it, it diminishes the power of the word. It actually speaks to slavery. That redemption is about the Hebrew culture where a slave would literally be into slavery because if a thief was caught, he was now pushed into slavery. So if you were caught and you were a thief, now for the next however many years, seven years, you are now the property of the person you stole from. And Hebrew law says, now you can't overwork them. You got, you, 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 you got to let them live with you. And they got to be a part of your family. But, but, but they going to know that they're a slave. And the only way you can get free is jubilee. Unless somebody redeems you. So the phrase actually, we, we, we see redemption, but the phrase, Stephanie, is really, it means to buy back. Also, it means to buy up. To purchase up. 
So someone had to calculate the wages and what it would take to make right with the person who was wrong in order for you to be redeemed. And if they couldn't do that, then you had to wait until a season called Jubilee. So I sit there and I said to redeem those who are under the law. And most times we'll just see that as they redeem them from law. But here's the consequence. Who are we paying back? Because in our finite minds, we're thinking we're paying back Satan. We don't owe Satan nothing. The debt was to God for the sin in our lives. Are y'all here? In an institution that he set up. Work right here, do hard. So now the slave will work with the family, live with the family, know they're guilty, and everybody knew that they were guilty because they lived with this family. You got a new family member because they stole. They didn't live in your home, but they lived on your quarters because you stole. So what Jesus does, Jesus decides, what God decides, I got I to gotta break this system. It was put in place to show them my holiness. Yeah. But if I'm going to redeem mankind back to me, yeah. I got to make sure that I purchase through my son what will be expensive enough to satisfy my debt toward them or their debt toward me. So there's nothing that they can give me that will satisfy my debt. But I love them so much, I will empty out heaven momentarily Occupy poverty, which is a tent. Let my son live 33 and a half years. And then I will take my son's life. Or rather, make him lay it down. And then it will satisfy the debt that they owe me. But here's the blessing. I said, Lord, you got to show me something. What is the mystery? I'm done. He says, stand to your feet. I'm done. I'm done. Stand to your feet. I'm done. He says... This is how you're going to satisfy it. I did two things so that the enemy can't have nothing on you. You ready? Number one, I satisfied the debt with my son. But number two was also Jubilee. This is what most people don't know. That when Christ died, it was Jubilee. So I'm redeemed because of what he paid. And then I'm also redeemed because this is the year to be redeemed. Redeemed. I'll prove it to you. Jesus walks into the synagogue, turns to Isaiah 61. And he talks about the Spirit of the Lord is upon me, for he hath anointed me to preach the gospel, and blah, blah, blah. And then he says, This brandy, he says, he says, he says, to preach that this is the Lord, the year of the Lord's favor, or that this is the acceptable year of the Lord translates out yeah. this is jubilee yeah. Christ basically said I am your jubilee yeah. so what did he free us from the penalty of sin death hell and the grave yeah. but not just that I read it to you early surely he have borne our griefs, carried our sorrows. Yet we did seem him smitten, stricken of God, and afflicted. But he was bruised. Come on here. For our trans, he was whipped for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace, come here, Bible, was upon him, and by his stripes. Which is why we can act like sons now. Because we're no longer slaves to sin and the repercussions of sin. Look at somebody down your way and tell them, he pardoned me. He pardoned me. He purchased my salvation. Set me upon a rock. So I'm free. What if I told you that there, are no, there is nothing on you? At all. What if I told you that what you're asking God to do was done? Y'all clapping. 
What if I told you you're already healed? What if I told you that you've already been fixed? What if I told you you're not in trouble with God? Let me prove it. When it was done, it was done. But the problem is we still see him as the child not ready for the inheritance. But when you mature, you understand I'm not waiting on God to do a thing he already did. Lift those hands, let me pray for you.